As we come to Mark chapter 9, we are taking a look at Jesus the disruptor. And we've said that Jesus disrupts nature, he disrupts expectations, traditions, and he disrupts the spirit world. This morning, we're going to take a look at an example of Jesus disrupting expectations. Because what we'll see is that the disciples had certain expectations about how they should relate to Jesus and how they should relate to others. And Jesus turns those expectations upside down and inside out. Uh, The disciples, in many cases, thought that they were helping Jesus, but instead they were actually hindering Jesus. They they thought that they were supporting Jesus, when in fact they were working at cross-purposes with Jesus. And the same thing can be true of us sometimes today. Oftentimes we think we know what we're doing, we've we've got it right, and that we're going to do this because that's what Jesus would want us to do, and this is what's going to strengthen the church, and this is what's going to expand the kingdom, and yet sometimes, sometimes we're hindering Christ instead of helping him. And so this morning we're going to take a look at four problems hindrances that can enter into the church. And you see, sometimes we think that we're helping Jesus, when in actuality, all we're doing is making trouble for Jesus. And so we're going to take a look at four problems that can enter into the church, how the disciples thought they should deal with these problems, and then how Jesus corrects them. So if you are there in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50, maybe you have it up on your phone or on your device, let's just start reading. We're going to take a look at verse 30 down through verse 32. He says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Now remember, Jesus and the disciples had traveled north about 25 miles to Caesarea Philippi. And while they were in the north, Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John up onto the mountaintop to experience the transfiguration. They had come down off the mountain. Jesus cast the demon out of a young boy. And now they've headed back south, and they're back into the area of Galilee. But it says Jesus didn't want anyone to know where he was with his disciples because he was teaching his disciples. We are in the last stretch of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. And so he's starting to pull back from public ministry, and he's trying to focus his time and his energy on the disciples to get them ready. And what we see here is we see the first problem. And this problem sometimes crops up in churches, and it is confusion. It is confusion. Jesus tells the disciples once again, he says, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But it tells us that the disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. They didn't understand what he meant. They were confused. And if we're honest, there are some things in the Bible that are confusing. There are some passages in the Bible that are difficult to understand. There are a number of places in the Gospels where we read that it says the disciples did not understand what Jesus was trying to say. And so if you ever find reading the Bible difficult at times, or if you ever find something in the Bible confusing, you can take great comfort from something Peter wrote. 2 Peter 3, Peter says, Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. So if sometimes you find it hard to understand the Bible as you read it, you're in good company, all right? You don't have to be ashamed that you find it difficult. But there might be something else at play here. Satan wants us to be confused about what the Bible teaches. 
Satan wants us to doubt whether or not we can trust the Bible. So Satan tries to plant seeds of doubt and confusion in our minds. Do you remember how Satan came at Eve in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say that? Are you sure that's what God meant? I don't think you're understanding that correctly. And so sometimes it's not just our confusion. Sometimes it is Satan at work trying to plant in our minds seeds of doubt and confusion. But the issue is, what do you do with your confusion? What do you do with your confusion? And what we see the disciples did here is it said they didn't understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Maybe they were too embarrassed. Maybe they thought Jesus would be disappointed. So what they did is they tried to hide the fact that they were confused. And oftentimes, when people get confused in reading the Bible, what they do is they stop reading. They get discouraged. They stop listening to the Word of God. Maybe they abandon it altogether. And, and Jesus disrupts this expectation because he says, if we're confused, they should have just asked him. And if we're confused, we should read, ask, and study. Don't try to hide it and cover it up. Instead, make the effort to dig in deeper and discover. And let me just share three things that we need to do if we're confused concerning the Bible. We need to read the Bible. Many people are confused about the Bible because they just don't know enough about Bible basics. So we need to read the Bible. We need to study the Bible. If all you do is read the Bible, there will continue to be things that you are confused about. But if you take the time and you make the effort to dig into it and to study it out, you will understand much more. And then, study the Bible with groups of people. Because when you study the Bible in a group, there's accountability there. There's encouragement there. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so, in a group, we help each other grow spiritually. So the first problem was confusion. Let's continue reading. Verse 33. It says, They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, and does not welcome me but the one who sent me. And the problem here is just simply pride. It's pride. What the disciples were debating and arguing about on the way was who was greatest. Hey, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. I'm greater than you. Yeah, well, I'm greater than the both of you. Well, that's okay, because I'm greater than all of you. Okay? Baiting and arguing this, and it was pride. And we know that the disciples knew and understood that pride is sinful because they wouldn't admit to Jesus that's what they were doing. They wouldn't confess to Jesus that they were arguing about who was greatest. You know what the Bible says about pride? The Bible says that pride is being preoccupied with yourself and not focused enough on God. The Bible says that God hates pride. The Bible says that pride destroys relationships. The Bible says that pride is a roadblock to grace. The Bible says that pride can destroy churches. And so Jesus is confronting them with their prideful attitude. And they knew it was sinful, and they knew it was wrong, and yet still they thought that greatness was about self-promotion, pushing themselves forward, making other people bow to them. And Jesus disrupts this. He disrupts this in a very powerful way. What he says here is he says, Whoever 
wants to be first, must be the very last, and the servant of all. The servant of all. The word there is actually deacon or minister. And you want to know what the root of that word literally is? I love this. The root of that word actually means to kick up the dust in a rush to go and meet the needs of others. To kick up the dust, being in a rush to go and meet the needs of others. You see what Jesus is saying here? Sometimes we struggle with pride. And Jesus says here that importance, elevation, recognition, that doesn't happen by self-promotion. That doesn't help happen by trying to make people be impressed with you. Jesus says the way to greatness is humility and serving others and lifting them up. It's less of you and more of them. And to illustrate it, Jesus takes a small child. It might have been an infant, might have been a toddler, but definitely it was a small child. And Jesus holds this child in his arms. And he says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. He uses this child as an illustration. Matthew, as he shares this conversation, he he expands it over many more verses and gives us much more detail. But Matthew makes it very clear that this is an illustration, and Jesus' point is this. Anyone who comes to Christ must come to Christ as a child, or like a child. Children are helpless. Children are dependent. Children are rebellious. Children are simple. And so, coming to Christ, we must come to Christ helpless, knowing that we can't save ourselves. We must come to Christ knowing our rebellion. We are sinners. We must come to Christ understanding our simplicity. We just don't know what it is that we don't know. And Jesus says here that every person who comes to Christ must come as a child. And so that means if you are in Christ, you're a child and I'm a child. Every Christian you and I meet is a child. A child of God, a child of the kingdom. And what Jesus says to his disciples, remember he's still teaching them about humility. He's still teaching them about becoming a servant to others. Jesus says here that we must welcome them. We must welcome them. That word means that in the body of Christ, we are to treat other Christians as if they are honored guests because they have Jesus in them. Now, I don't know who you would consider an honored guest in your home, but imagine that an honored guest showed up at your house. How would you treat them? Okay, would you, would you just say, ah, it's late, I'm going to bed. There's some sheets in the closet, there's a pillow in there when you get tired, make a bed on the couch, see you in the morning. Or would you tell them, my bed is ready for you. I put on clean sheets. It's ready for you. I'll sleep on the couch. You take the bed. If they were an honored guest, would you say to them, hey, if you ever get thirsty, there's the faucet. Maybe there's some Cokes in the fridge. Or would you ask them, are you thirsty? Could I get you something to drink? If they came into the room, would you tell them, hey, sit down and be quiet because I'm watching something. Or would you hand the controller to them? How would you treat an honored guest in your home? Jesus says that if we want to be great, if we want to be elevated, then we need to, we need to serve others. It's less about us. It's more about them. 
and we have to treat our brothers and sisters in Christ as if they are an honored guest in our home. Is that how you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus pointed out to the disciples that they had a pride problem. And the way to overcoming it is to become a servant. Become a servant. Well, go on. Verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Now, literally what this says is that this is John's answer to Jesus. This is John's reply to what Jesus had just said. The disciples had been arguing about who is greatest, and Jesus answered them by saying, the most important person is the one who is the greatest servant of others. And John's response to that is, well, okay, but that just, that just refers to the 12 of us, right, Jesus? We can't let anybody else have a position of prominence. In fact, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we told them to stop because they weren't one of us. And the term we can put on this, the problem that sometimes rears its head in the church, exclusion. Apparently, there was a person casting out demons, making people's lives better, helping the hurting. And this person was doing it in the name of Jesus and doing it by the power of God, but they were not one of the twelve. And so the disciples told the person to knock it off. Stop doing that. Maybe they weren't doing it the way the disciples would do it. Maybe they didn't use the words that the disciples would use. But whatever the reason, they told the person to stop. Just stop it. And Jesus disrupts their thinking. He disrupts their actions because what he tells them is, whoever is not against us is for us. We are so quick to rationalize our exclusion of others. Hey, they didn't go to the right Bible college. They don't read the right Bible translation. They don't use the terms I'm used to using. Maybe their view of baptism isn't exactly the same as my view of baptism. Just because they don't dot every I and cross every T the way you do doesn't mean that you should tell them to stop. Instead, if they are trying to serve Christ and further the kingdom, Jesus says we should support them and encourage them. Doesn't mean we have to agree with them on everything. And so Jesus says here, whoever is not against us is for us. Now, interestingly, there's another passage in the Gospel of Matthew where he turns that around. And he says, whoever is not for us is against us. But completely different situations. In Matthew, he's talking about the religious leaders who think they can be neutral about Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You can't be neutral about me. You're either for me or against me. And if you're not for me, you're against me. But this context is different. Jesus, uh, Jesus is talking here about someone who is doing good, somebody who is serving others, somebody who is sharing the power and the love and the grace of Christ. And he says, whoever is not against us is for us. In this, the arms are open wide. And so he welcomes people in, and he says, we should not be exclusionary. We have no right or reason 
to tell people for slight and insignificant differences to stop doing what they're doing if they're trying to do it for Jesus and they're furthering the cause of Christ. Lastly, verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin or to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Now, Jesus still has this little child in his arms. And remember, this child represents every believer in Christ because we have to come to Christ in a childlike way. And the warning he gives to his disciples here is that his disciples should never do anything that might cause another believer to stumble. (laughs) This is Jesus talking to the twelve. This is Jesus talking to the men who have been with him for three years. And what Jesus says to them is don't ever become the reason another believer stumbles. And what he's talking about here is he's talking about being a sinful example. And sometimes this can be a problem in the church. Sometimes, sometimes people are damaged and hurt because of the sinful example of others. Now, please don't misunderstand. This is not saying that we must be perfect. Because we can't be perfect. And we aren't perfect. But... We can do great damage by giving a sinful example to others. And I think really what this boils down to is our attitude about sin. If I sin, and my attitude about my sin is, who cares? It's not that big a deal. It's none of your business. Well, then I might very well be giving somebody an example by which they stumble. But if I sin, and my attitude about my sin is, I do not do what I want to do. And I keep doing the very thing I don't want to do. And I hate it. And my sin is a horrible offense against God. And I'm sorry. And I will do everything I possibly can to prevent you from following down my same pathway. I will do everything I can to help prevent you from following my sinful example because I understand the hurt of it and the pain of it and the damage of it and the guilt of it and the shame of it. Well, that's that's a godly, selfless, loving attitude about my sin. And Jesus says here that if we give a sinful example to others, there are severe consequences. He says that that if we cause somebody else to stumble because of our example, he says it would be better for us if a millstone were hung around our neck and we were thrown into the sea. And what Jesus is talking about here, he's talking about the large bottom millstone that was used in New Testament times. They would use another stone on the top to crush the grain. But best estimates are that the bottom millstone used would weigh over 3,000 pounds. And so Jesus is saying here, if you give somebody else a sinful example, it would be better for you if a 3,000-pound millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. That's not a very hopeful picture, is it? (laughs) And so Jesus teaches these disciples. He corrects these disciples. And he does it with very graphic descriptive language here. This is very, very disruptive. Very disruptive. And what he's saying is, get radical about the sin in your life. 
He says that if you sin with your hand and your sinful example is caused by your hand, cut off your hand. And if your sinful example isn't what you do, but it's where you go, cut off your feet. And if your sinful example isn't what you do or where you go, but it's what you see, it's what you look at, it's what you covet, he says, gouge out your eyes. And as Matthew tells this, Matthew has Jesus make a statement like this. Listen, people are going to be tempted. Just make sure that they aren't being tempted by your sinful example. The disciples were not perfect. The disciples at times thought that they were helping Jesus when they were hurting Jesus. They thought that they were um, working side by side with Jesus to strengthen the kingdom when in fact they were working at cross purposes with Jesus. They thought they were relating to Jesus correctly and Jesus says they aren't. They thought that they were relating to others the way they should, and Jesus corrects them. And we aren't perfect either. Sometimes we think that we are helping and being constructive when quite honestly, all we're doing is making trouble for Jesus. When we get confused, instead of reading more and digging in, we we stop reading and we stop being inquisitive. In our pride, we try to promote ourselves when what we should do is think less of ourselves and more of others. We become exclusionary. We think that we should limit people and tell them no and that they can't do this and they can't do that because somehow that elevates our importance. When anybody who wants to serve Christ and further the cause of Christ, we should support and encourage. And we need to be aware of the possibility of leaving a sinful example for others. Now, in the last couple of verses, what Jesus says here to the disciples is he tells them to salt themselves. And all that really means is Jesus says, don't make excuses and don't point fingers at others, but purify yourself. And Jesus telling that to the disciples, he's really telling it to us. Don't make excuses for yourself. And don't point fingers at others. But when and where we see confusion, pride, exclusion, or a sinful example, we need to repent of that and confess that to God. So that instead of making trouble for Jesus, we might actually contribute to the cause of Christ. Heavenly Father, none of us are perfect. We know it only too well, but we want to become more perfect. That's our pursuit. That's our passion. And Father, we want to have an impact on the people around us that's positive and points them to Jesus. And so these four problems that we see in the disciples, and Father, we know sometimes it's true in our own lives and true in the church, Help us to correct these things, to change these things. Disrupt, Father, our usual way of thinking and doing and operating. Help us to repent. Help us to confess. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.